Okay. I think, I think I've got that before I, I was about to get off of the air altogether, but I think I got that fixed. All right. I see with another setting change behind the scenes. Uh, so this is to Facebook and uh, Facebook and YouTube friends. If you guys can hear me now, Okay, I see some clapping hands from Vivian. Does that mean that my audio is coming through? <laughs> I want to be totally sure. I had a whole bunch of software updates. Okay, sounds good. Soon, thank you so much. Gene can hear. Okay, we're in business. <laughs> I'm going to kick things off again and bring the Instagram folks back. Okay, here we go. Chris has got it. Hey, back with you guys on Instagram. We've got all the platforms up. Audio is working. My apologies, you guys. I was spending a whole bunch of time prepping for this. And in doing so, a bunch of settings changed behind the scenes. And I didn't check all those settings. So yeah, I guess I got to make a checklist of things to go through that can change even when I don't change them. So anyway, here we go. So first, I'm talking about saunas. I got a good question about sauna use. And I've seen a lot of Hmm. I wouldn't say research per se, but I've seen a lot of people selling saunas, talking about massive benefits of saunas. And I spent some time and did a recent literature analysis on this topic because someone did send in a question about it. And I want to share a few thoughts with you guys about the whole topic. So saunas, uh, good or bad, really are about heat shock proteins, also called HSPs. I'm seeing a lot of old friends jumping back, a lot of new people here. Welcome, welcome. So yeah, Office Hours Live, we're talking about all things thyroid, hormones, general health, you know, diet, weight, those sorts of things. And this is about saunas. I have some questions about that. So heat shock proteins. Funny thing I learned about heat shock proteins from a physiology professor in probably about 1995. And <laughs> I learned about them while he and I were out on a run together. Well, we were out on a run, and it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon in Phoenix in July. <laughs> so that's why heat shock proteins came up. If you're from here, if you've been here, you don't really do that much because it's pretty darn hot. And it's pretty darn hard on your body. So heat shock proteins, like a lot of things, they've got this stress response curve where they're, they're a stressor, they're a shock, they're a trauma on the body. And in response to that trauma... If the dose is enough to be a strong enough signal, but not so much that it's just overwhelming, the body comes back stronger in certain ways. So some proteins can repair it themselves. This can improve clotting, uh, platelet aggregation. This can improve muscle retention, muscular growth. This may have neurologic benefits. This may protect the heart from overall damage and premature aging. Now, in excess, heat shock proteins are what cause heat exhaustion and ultimately heat stroke. So of course they can be fatal at some point of excess. But uh, the, like a lot of things, small amounts of them can be of some benefit. So what we know about saunas is, is that they are activators of heat shock proteins. So yeah, if these things are triggered to some extent, they can yield a good variety of health benefits. So the question is really, um, is this the only way to activate heat shock proteins? And saunas do activate them, but they're not the only way. In fact, one large paper showed that hot water immersion has about the same effect on them. So if you don't have a sauna in your house, you can take a hot bath <laughs> and you'll probably see similar effects. So I want to just throw something out to you guys. I'd love to see uh, people try to answer this question. Uh, if if, if hot baths and saunas can trigger heat shock proteins and they work by improving cardiovascular function, they correlate with increased heart rate, what else might do that? Any guesses on what else might activate heat shock proteins about other things that might turn them on and give similar benefits? I'll keep an eye open for any uh, feedback, any comments about that. So yeah, what else could turn on heat shock proteins? So activating them can be helpful. I saw a question near or far. And yeah, there's been a lot of talk about far infrared, you know, near infrared. Honestly, these are marketing terms. These are not really terms from science. These are terms to make things sound exciting and enticing. So heat is infrared radiation. There's really no other way you can heat without having infrared radiation. And near or far, infrared radiation is defined 
by certain wavelengths. So it is what it is. And whether you're hot because you're in a hot car or whether you're hot because you're outside or maybe you've left the oven on, there's more infrared radiation of a variety of wavelengths. And they're not different based upon the actual wave. There's subtle differences within the spectrum of what's infrared. So this is a wavelength that's too long to be visible to our eyes, but we feel it. So when you see soldiers that wear those night goggles, right? And everything kind of lights up that phosphorescent green, they're seeing infrared. It's not like they only see saunas and nothing else. <laughs> they see everything that has some warmth because infrared is everything that has warmth. <laughs> so yeah, infrared, you guys, it's a marketing term. It's not a term from actual science or physics. So don't put any weight whatsoever on that. I'm seeing some really good questions. I mean, I'm sorry, some really good guesses come up. Sitting in the sun, high outdoor temperatures, um, ice bath. Ice baths, funny thing, they actually would not induce heat shock proteins, but they do provide a lot of similar hormetic benefits because the body responds so strongly to them. Uh, spicy food, uh, hot yoga, probably the central one that I was thinking about, those are all right. They're all good examples. And they are all things that can yield health benefits. But in terms of what has had like the most documentation, the most accessible and the most clear benefit, uh, Jennifer said exercise. And yeah, in fact, all the studies about sauna, pretty much all the studies will say that these are some of the benefits we see in exercise. And one recent study from Germany showed that sauna had almost the benefit of a walk that lasted for a similar duration. And that was a big headline. You know, saunas can work like exercise. That's great. Um, you know what else works like exercise? <laughs> um, exercise works like exercise. <laughs> So yeah, you can do saunas and I have nothing at all against saunas. They, they certainly can be useful, but even the benefits for detoxification. So those come from exercise. You know, when you're sweating, you're actually detoxifying in the same sorts of ways. So I've had many people feel like there's this big thing that they don't have access to because they don't have the, 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 the budget or the space to put a sauna in their house. And I think that if one has one, and you're socializing, you've already done some exercise and physical activity. Yeah, that, no, no drawback to that. But I wouldn't think of it as a replacement for exercise. Exercise yields many benefits that sauna does not. So if you're already doing well on that, I wouldn't feel like you're missing out on something. If there's reasons why you're limited from exercise, you actually can't, you probably could get some of the benefits from that better than none. But really, it's just like a weak version of exercise. Um, Let's see, if you don't break a sweat during a walk, still similar, good question, Jennifer. Now, not breaking a sweat, uh, the intensity and the duration of exercise affect that. So I'm not saying that a gentle walk is like all, all the benefit of all exercise. It is beneficial to break a sweat and better forms of exercise as far as duration and intensity will cause you to break a sweat. Now, if you're somewhere like I am now in the Sonoran Desert, it's so dry here you're often not aware of sweating. You know, you're not, you're not wet and sticky when you're sweating because it evaporates so quickly. Or where I was not too long ago in Northern Minnesota in the cold winters, it's also so dry. If you dress properly, your clothes wick, um, otherwise you trap moisture. But even then you're not really aware of sweating. So many types of exercise do still cause sweating, but you're not always as aware of it. But, but yes, sweating is a good thing, however that happens. So related questions, let me grab some related questions here. I'm going to clear that image out real quick. Um, this was one. Yeah, studies pointing to old school Finnish saunas is effective versus infrared. The infrared ones don't get as hot. Yeah, again, Krista, infrared is just a marketing term. You know, saunas, saunas are hot. If you're if you got infrared goggles on and you see 10 different saunas that are on, they're all going to look the same based upon their temperature. So I wouldn't that that's that's really a marketing thing not a not a thing from science and then here's another related one good question what about red light therapy can sitting in the sun or working in the sun have the same benefits as red light therapy short answer is sitting in the sun doesn't yield all that many of these benefits uh, in terms of red light therapy uh, you will get similar wavelengths, not the same. But the biggest health benefits from all these things we're talking about come from exercise. <laughs> and that doesn't come from really anything besides exercise. So it's it seems so so tempting. What's like this, this thing that can help? What's the shortcut? What's the hack? 
And I always want to when I always want to catch myself when I think that way. And you know, what is the one thing that obviously would work? You know, what's the one thing you know would work? Like if someone, I don't know, if someone's getting the results you want, well, yeah, but they did this. They did this thing that's really hard but works. Well, that's the thing to do. <laughs> that's not the thing to say. How do I work around it? That's the thing to do. That's the thing to focus on. So that's my thought process about that. Um, and a question that just came in is great because this relates to another topic that I was going to talk about. So a lot of you guys are just coming on and with you all on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook right now. I'm going to mention some images. They're not as visible on Instagram. They will be on the replay. So hang tight for that. But I had a question someone just asked now about ways to fix leaky gut. And that was one that I've got a lot about in the recent past, a lot of questions about. Let me get the correct images up here. Okay. So ways to fix leaky gut. Um, here's a basic idea about what this thing is. And one concept which is really important is that there are debates as to whether leaky gut is a chicken or an egg. What I mean by that is the view in natural medicine is that for whatever reason, these junctures between cells become too porous, too large. Bad stuff comes in, the body attacks the bad stuff, and we get sick. And if you could just go in there and like paint over that and block it all, things would be okay. That's kind of the superficial, simplified story about leaky gut and natural medicine. Uh, we now know it's that's not a true story. The reason is because there have been studies done in which they've used substances to actually reverse leaky gut, but it doesn't change the consequences. So the new emerging perspective is that this is a real phenomena. And it is true that in the cases of autoimmune diseases, in the case of immune deficits, chronic inflammation, there often is a heightened permeability of the intestinal tract. But the debate is, is that a cause or is that an effect? And further thought is, is that an adaptive effect? So to say someone has leaky gut is almost like to say someone has height. <laughs> we all have it. It's normal. It's an adaptation. But to what degree? And when it is exaggerated, is that causing disease or is that the cause? Is that caused by disease? That's the question that's really being wrestled with right now. So normal permeability is essential to bring in nutrients. And it's also essential to bring in immune cells and recruit them to the gut lining. But in many states of illness, that immunity is that, that those gaps are larger. So other studies have looked at this too, and they've said that if the leaky gut is the cause, if you treat the disease without addressing the leaky gut, the leaky gut should persist and other problems should come back. So to answer that question, they would take people that had inflammation from an autoimmune disease, and they would treat them with biologic medicines that worked outside the intestinal tract. And they would show through symptom changes and serologic markers that they largely reversed the disease process, but they did nothing for the intestinal tract. So when they reversed the disease process in the body, the leaky gut went away. It went away by itself when the whole disease went away. But in other studies in which they just focused on the gut, they just blocked the leaky gut and reversed that, that didn't change the disease process. So the emerging idea is more like not that leaky gut causes disease, but something that causes disease can also cause leaky gut. That's what we're thinking about that. So what are these underlying things that allow inflammation to get out of control that give rise to autoimmune disease and leaky gut? Well, it seems that the core issue does come back to intestinal health, and it seems that much of these issues revolve around short-chain fatty acids. So the old idea we thought was that Good bacteria were good because they were there and they, they did nice things. They, they, they pushed away the bad bacteria. The emerging model is they're good more so because of what they make. And their wastes, their byproducts, those are fuels for the colonocytes, for the cells that line the intestinal tract. And those fuels are fuels. They're food for the cells. They let the cells undergo metabolism, like take in nutrients and do things. They also regulate immunity. They also help the cells repair, and they also protect against DNA damage. So these short-chain fats do all these good things. And of the short-chain fats, the one that's had probably the largest amount of literature on it is one called butyrate. And this is a cool thing. This is a four-carbon fatty acid, so it's a very short molecule. But it is what is relevant for regulating those junctions. 
when it is abundant, these junctions can readily heal themselves. Here's a pretty cool image that shows a study. And these are a group of, of intestinal cells, epithelial cells, and they were all damaged by just being pulled apart physically. The top ones, after 38 hours, were unable to reconnect. The bottom ones were given a tiny amount of butyrate, a really tiny five millimolar solution of butyrate, and they came right back together again. Now, I've got that actual, an actual movie of this happening, and let's see if that's gonna work for us. Uh, this will be visible on the, on the YouTube and Facebook, and I think it is working. So the first video, these are those cells, and they're growing, they're changing, but they can't close that gap. They can't come back together again. Now, the next one is these same cells given a tiny solution of butyrate. And what's happening is they're closing back together. It's these two cells that are separated and they're growing right back together again. And the time frame is 38 hours. We've, of course, sped it up. <laughs> but they could not reconnect before then. They were unable to do so without the exposure to butyrate. So then the question is, well, where does butyrate come from? How do you get butyrate? Um, you've got options. Now, the name itself, butyrate, and again, this is like the thing that reverses the underlying problems behind the inflammation that causes leaky gut. So we're not trying to patch up leaky gut. We're fixing the problems that gave rise to leaky gut. This is one more step back. So the name itself, butyrate, um, any guesses as to where butyrate might come from? Just given the name butyrate, where might you find butyrate in as far as foods go? <laughs> I'm going to watch for a couple of guesses. Let me give you guys a hint about that. <laughs> I'm seeing a few good guesses coming in. Yeah, there's butyrate in butter. So Melissa is saying butyrates and fiber. Melissa, you're 10 steps ahead of me. You're giving the best answer, but I've not gotten to that answer yet. <laughs> so good job, but just sit on it for a minute. Just hang tight. Yeah, so this stuff is in butter. And I see this talked about a lot. I've seen countless blogs say, if you want to heal leaky gut, you've got to eat more butter. You've got to add more butter to your diet because butter has butyrate. Butter, butyrate, butter, butyrate. I see this over and over again. Someone who's just saying about yeah, I won't, I won't, I don't want to say too much. I don't want to disparage anyone. But yeah, butter and butyrate. So how does the math play out on this stuff? How much butter do you have to eat to boost up your butyrate? Well, let's play with some numbers. So butyrate has been shown to reverse inflammatory bowel disease, and it's been shown to reverse these problems we've talked about. How much does that take? Somewhere around 8,000 milligrams a couple times a day. Okay, so butter is just contains pure butyrate. Butter is not pure butyrate, but it contains pure butyrate. So you take it by mouth and it winds its way down, hopefully to your intestines. But how much? Well, butter is somewhere around 3% butyrate. It'll vary from type to type, but not by huge amounts. You won't see it much higher than 3%. So what about those who cannot have dairy of any kind? Hang tight. I'm, you guys, I'm not pushing butter. <laughs> Listen up and sit on it for a minute. I'm not pushing butter. There's a, there's a punchline coming up here. <laughs> so to get that 8,000 milligram dose, uh, which you want a couple times a day, you would need about that much butter. <laughs> so I'm not exaggerating. You need about three sticks of butter to get your day's dose of butyrate from butter. Now, those three sticks of butter, um, that's a lot of food, right? That's not a healthy thing to add to your diet. Um, I did the math. That's about 160 grams of saturated fat. That's about, uh, I think I came out to like 7,000 some odd calories. So not a good thing. And I'm not disparaging a bit of butter here and there. It's not poison, bad, evil, but it's also not a tonic. It doesn't have magical, healthful properties. So uh, someone said a moment ago about fiber. Melissa said fiber. Now, Melissa, fiber, yes, but there's subtypes. So fiber... I want us to not think about fiber as a thing and think about fiber as a category. You know, it's kind of odd that we have fiber on labels. It says dietary fiber, 15 grams. Fiber is a category. There's a whole lot of kinds of fiber. And to be really precise, it's resistant starch that we make butyrate out of. Over 90% of the resistant starch in our intestinal tract, I'm sorry, over 90% of the butyrate in our intestinal tract is made solely from resistant starch that are broken down by your bacteria. If you don't consume resistant starch, you won't have high amounts of butyrate. 
And again, butyrate heals the inflammation that causes leaky gut. It also reverses inflammatory bowel disease. It improves insulin metabolism. It lowers colorectal cancer risk. Now it's been shown to improve quality of sleep. There's a long list of things that it helps because your health revolves around your intestinal tract. So a healthy tummy is a healthy you. <laughs> and butyrate makes a healthy tummy. So resistant starch, uh, where does that come from? Uh, well, of course, I just had some beans up here. Cannellini beans, you know, all the white beans are good sources of that. It does take about four or five servings a day for that 8,000 milligrams. Uh, bananas have it as well. Bananas, that's somewhere around four a day for that 8,000 milligram dose. Now, these might not be great bananas for the resistant starch content. Can anyone tell me why? I'd, be, I'd love to hear about that. Any, any reason why these bananas might not be as high in resistant starch as other bananas might? And I'll watch for answers and give a good shout out to someone who tells me. So yeah, why might these not be the highest sources of resistant starch? Someone just said plantains, very much so, similar to bananas, they've got to be cooked. Uh, but Gene said it, they need to be green. <laughs> these, these are too ripe. Lots of folks are saying, Soon is saying it, Annie, Lucy, yeah, too ripe. Gluten-free knows too. These are too ripe, yep. So if these were less ripe and they were more green. Now, there's another way to get resistant starch from bananas and it still works even if they are ripe. So what's, what's that? How do you get them out of that if they're still ripe? And this is a cool trick. So I'll watch for answers to that. How do you get resistant starch from ripe bananas? This is a tricky one. Other big food source, I'll watch for answers and watch and talk about that. Oh, Michelle nailed it right out of the gate. Good job, Michelle. You eat the peels. <laughs> so that's weird to a lot of Westerners, but it's not weird to many other cultures. They're totally good foods. So yeah, you can take these peels. Someone said earlier about organic. I agree with that. I prefer organic for eating the peels. So organic ones, you wanna lose, you wanna lose the stem about there and lose the tip about there. And then I would chop it into a couple of pieces and just throw the whole darn thing into the blender and blend the heck out of it. Now, when they're frozen, they give a really nice texture to your shakes, but even half of them, you can blend up and have it in there and it'll work well. Now, Laura's saying cook then cool. Uh, you, you can cook the peels, actually. The peels themselves, you can treat them kind of like okra. What I do with those is I'll take the peel and slice it up into ribbons and use that in a savory stir fry dish like okra. And that, that can work fine, it's a totally good food. So other big food source would be potatoes. So potatoes are dense in that, of course, when they're boiled and chilled especially, not so much when they're baked, definitely not when they're fried, not when they're air fried either, just too much temperature. And what happens is many people will think about, they'll say, hey, look, I, I don't wanna do a lot of potatoes because I'm AIP, I'm avoiding nightshades or I don't wanna do massive amounts of bananas because I'm watching my food intake, or I can't do them, or I can't do a lot of beans because I've been so low carb for so long, I can't digest carbohydrates. So when the, and then and other people will say, well, I've been trying powders. I went and got green banana flour, or I got potato flour. Uh, just a quick one to Jennifer. Sweet potatoes are great foods for a dozen reasons. They, they do contain RS. They're quite a ways down on the list. They're not big needle movers. They're actual content of RS. So much a lot of exact same question at the same time. Sweet potatoes, good foods, wonderful foods, not high RS sources. So not none, but not a whole heck of a lot, not game changers. So back to the powders. So the drawback about the powders is that you don't know how much RS they have in them. I made this mixture called RS Complete uh, first time about I think six, seven years ago, but it took about four years to make it. I first thought that we could just get some good raw materials. We could get some organic potato flour, some green banana flour, put these things together, call it a day. But what happened was our raw materials, first off, we had to develop technology to actually assay for resistant starch. You guys know me, I'm the naturopathic skeptic. I, I want safe, natural things. And I want to be darn sure they work. I want to do real stuff that's actually going to be helpful for people. So I demanded we find ways to assay and measure the RS in there. We did. The raw materials we got, most of them didn't have RS in them. They said they did. They said they would. So when you go on Amazon and you buy unmodified potato flour, you buy green banana flour, you may not be getting RS in that. You may not get any at all. 
The other big thought is that many wish to avoid allergens or lectins or things from nightshades. So that's why we made RS complete. This is standardized to contain RS. This has 4,000 milligrams per serving in it. So yeah, so each, each scoop of this is the same as those three sticks of butter as far as the butyrate production content. <laughs> and it's cool stuff. It's flavorless. You just throw it in water, throw it in your shake, wash it down. But yeah, butyrate is like the secret sauce for intestinal health. And RS is the main way to get butyrate. Is it AIP? So AIP uh, wants to avoid elements from nightshades. And the main things there are lectins and also the amino glycosides. So there is potato flour here, but it is free of lectins and free of amino glycosides. So I know many who do use that on AIP diets. It won't say the list is things that you would avoid on AIP, but again, it's avoided those parts. There are issues for that. So that's, that's a distinction. All right. So enough about RS and butyrate. Um, does potato starch have RS? Jacqueline, uh, yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> that's what I was saying. So when you buy it, it might, but it might not. And that's, that was, that's why we took so long. We took four years to get the product going because the samples were so hit or miss. We had to finally get suppliers that could consistently give us products that had high amounts of RS. So it can. Here's a great one, Lucy. What if someone struggles with SIBO? So this has been studied. Now, SIBO is a fascinating thing. This is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's treated like it's an infection. It's not an infection. They've shown that the bacteria that cause SIBO are normal bacteria. They're normal bacteria that belong in the colon. But what's happening with SIBO is the small intestine is dumping too quickly. It's pushing stuff in the colon too fast. So imagine you've got, a, you've got an old steam railroad engine and the engine's running too hot. You could say, well, this is bad coal in the engine. Or you could say, they're putting in the coal too quickly. <laughs> so that's what SIBO is. The problems, the neurologic problems with movement in the small intestine push substrate too quickly into the large intestine. And there's a paper that I just finished up that'll come out soon. And in it, I mentioned a study, actually an old paper I've got about IBS cites this as well. They've shown that those changes that disrupt the neurologic enteric nervous system are benefited by butyrate. They're benefited by resistant starch. Now, a paradox is that when your intestinal flora is completely bereft, when there's like no flora diversity, anything you give that feeds the bacteria can cause short-term symptoms. So the sad thing is that too often people think, oh, if that caused symptoms, I will avoid that then, oh, that also causes symptoms, I will avoid that. And it's logical, but you get yourself painted into a corner. Soon, there's a big long list of what you avoid and a tiny list of what you can eat, if anything. So the real solution for that is you've gotta be reasonable. You can't just like fill your body with things that hurt you, but you also can't avoid everything. It's often more a matter of doing gentle doses and inoculating yourself. So when someone does have flora problems and they can't tolerate healthy, normal foods, they can't eat normal foods that have fiber, the solution is not to get more and more and more restricted. The solution is to back out of that. And there's really no way out other than reversing the way that one went in. So it takes adding things back into the diet. And my experiences show me that there are ways you can do that slowly enough and gentle enough to make it where it's not traumatic. People can add in tiny amounts, you know, eighth of a teaspoon doses. You can take little pinches of powder and add that in on a daily basis. And when that goes down fine, you can do a little bit bigger of a pinch of powder and gently step up per your body's tolerance. So yeah, the idea of always finding what's bad and kind of running from it, um, I don't like that idea. I've, I've been down that road, you guys. I tried such restrictive diets in my early years. And if you read enough things about the foods that are bad and foods that are scary, you'll get nothing left to eat. You'll get like short lists of foods and you'll end up unhealthy and your gut will get lazy. Your gut will get unable to process most of anything. So yeah, it's healthier to have a wider range of food. And I just saw um, an amen from a nutritionist. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, you're, you don't win by eating the least food. You eating You win by being healthy and having a good variety of healthy foods in your diet 
not by being the most restrictive. Extreme diets are extremely likely to cause extreme problems. <laughs> I'll guarantee that. Okay, so trying to stick with a the theme. I'll grab a few more comments about this. We're talking about food today, apparently. We got going on that one. One came in about food sensitivities. Um, it does. And food sensitivities, I would put into two categories. There's foods that you eat that you know cause problems for you. And with that one, I would even think about that a little further. Are these foods you've always known cause problems for you? Or are these foods that cause problems after some book said those foods cause problems? Because <laughs> the latter, I would suspect. And I've done that before. I've, you know, we all have good days, bad days. We all have some symptoms that kind of come and go. That's normal. What happens is if you read things that sound convincing, why a certain food is bad, nightshades, oxalates, lectins, take your pick. If you read convincing enough reasons why that food is bad, our minds explain the normal ebb and flow of symptoms based on those foods. And then also we can have ebbs and flows of symptoms that are major symptoms that are perhaps not explained or not managed. But our minds say, oh, if this causes that, I ate this thing a little while ago, that must cause these symptoms. And that's a cycle that many get sucked into and it's dangerous. So that was one thing. Now, the other scenario, which I think you answered up for me, things that show up on food sensitivity tests. I have a lot of strong mixed feelings about food sensitivity tests. So for starters, there's, um, there's accuracy and precision with tests. Precision is how likely would the test give the same results if repeated? In almost all cases, not likely. So they've seen this, they've done this many studies on this. You can take food allergy tests and if the same person does the same test again, or even at the same time, they don't get the same results. They're not consistent. So, and they've also shown that diets based on food allergy tests don't change thyroid function. They don't have big effects upon health. There have been a couple of studies that have suggested that uh, digestive symptoms may improve on some types of IgG-based diets. Some studies suggest that. Some studies suggest they may not. Now, here's a weird wrinkle, you guys. So IgG, okay, someone did that. Yeah, so if you did do that from one of the companies I recommended, and if there are a few foods that are highly reactive, those are foods worth minimizing and avoiding, but they shouldn't be long-term issues. And things that heal the intestinal tract, that's the real key to get back a range of healthy diversity you want to be able to eat a big range of foods again. So, so yeah, it's better to take steps and gradually expand your diet and not make it more and more narrow. I got wound up about that, didn't I? <laughs> I'm talking really fast and really loud. Um, Lot's wife, I had a good sensitivity test and it, that kind of paused there. If you wanna put more on that question, I'll follow up because that's related. Another related one, uh, whether gluten itself causes leaky gut. There is a question about that for sure, Vivian. And what happens? What happened with that is most of the evidence about gluten causing leaky gut uh, comes from a couple of situations, one of which is those that have celiac disease. Now, the bizarre thing about celiac disease is that it's not caused by gluten. <laughs> it's aggravated by gluten, but celiac disease is an autoimmune disease. It's not a food sensitivity. So it's autoimmune because it's not an attack about gluten, it's an attack against glutaminase. Glutaminase is a normal enzyme inside the human body. Eating gluten can worsen the body's reaction to glutaminase. So it's an autoimmune disease. And we know that whatever base issues give rise to autoimmunity can also give rise to leaky gut. So the thought for a while was maybe leaky gut causes autoimmunity. That view is falling out of favor. Now, there was a study showing that People that have that don't have celiac, if you take a group of people that don't have celiac disease, one group avoids gluten, one group, group eats gluten. There was one study showing that the group eating gluten had more permeability than those that did not. And that was held up to be, you know, clear proof of gluten causing leaky gut for everyone. But the thing is, remember you guys, permeability is normal, like height is normal. So they were more permeable, but they weren't pathologically permeable they were still well within what was normal ranges. So it didn't make them have damage or negative changes within the range. It's kind of like being a short NFL player. I mean, I'm sorry, NBA player. Yeah, they weren't short people. <laughs> they were shorter than the group, but they weren't short. <laughs> so yeah, just some thoughts about that. Um, let's see, related questions. Grab a few more here. 
<laughs> and can we get a replay of this amazing talk? And yeah, no worries. You know, and I'm not sure when you came on, but I've been yammering here for a little bit. You might have missed some, but this will post a replay. It looks like you're on uh, YouTube. This will show up there when I'm finished as a full replay be available for you. Um, related questions. I had a food sensitivity and it showed gluten and wheat close to off the chart and tested for celiac five years and nothing makes me wonder. Yeah, Lot's wife. So food sensitivity tests and celiac tests are very different things. You're looking at different antibodies. Celiac is a real condition. And there are many people that have much better health comes by health outcomes by avoiding gluten. That's important for a lot of people. One big pitfall about celiac testing, I see a lot of people who have chosen to go gluten-free and somewhere along the way, they decide they also want to test to see if they have celiac disease. They want to know if if they have to remain gluten-free. Now, gluten-free nutritionist is with us on Instagram. I bet she knows why that's a problem. <laughs> I bet she's somewhere like raising her hand right now saying, I know the answer to this. So yeah, if someone's avoiding gluten, they're already gluten-free and they get tested for celiac, they don't have meaningful results. You can't have a positive test if you're not consuming gluten. Now, I'm not saying that if someone has seen important health changes by avoiding gluten, they have to go back to it, but they won't have meaningful test results. Now, one big wrinkle, there are genetic tests for celiac disease. I've heard many experts say, even if you are avoiding gluten, you can still do a genetic test and see if you have those genes for celiac disease. Those aren't recommended, and those are not used in gastroenterology. The reason for that is having a gene is not the same as having a gene activation. It's not the same thing at all, everyone. So I've got a lot of genes that are not active, and I've got ancestors that are Native American. Those aren't active genes. You know, if I showed up at the uh, Navajo Tribal Council of Elders, the room would get quiet. <laughs> I don't look like I belong there. I've got the genes, but they're not active. Yeah, somewhere around 60%, 60% of people have genes that could give rise to celiac disease. Somewhere around 1% of people have celiac disease. So the genes have no predictive value whatsoever. So yeah, that's just one big thing to bear in mind with testing for celiac. Um, are people with Hashi's more prone to food sensitivities? Never issued the food until recently. Full GI workup shows everything is good. Suggesting food issues. So aesthetic, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about just food sensitivities. If you mean you find that you can't digest foods, that's one thing. There's foods that now you don't tolerate. If you're saying a lot of stuff showed up on some food allergy test, I wouldn't put a whole lot of weight on that. Um, as far as thyroid function and these kind of problems, we know there is an overlap between Hashimoto's and celiac. Now, it's not a done deal, and it's not an overlap to where if you have Hashimoto's, you have celiac, but your odds are higher. And the numbers vary. Most studies clock in at about 3 to 5%. So if I just knew that you were an adult woman, you've got about a 1% chance of having celiac. If I knew you were an adult woman with thyroid disease, well, that's a 3 to 5% risk for celiac. So one way of saying that is, you've got five times the risk. And that sounds pretty dramatic. The other way of saying that is 95% of people who have thyroid disease do not have celiac disease. <laughs> it's the same data, but it's expressed very differently. So yeah, and that can certainly cause, if someone does have it and they're not aware of it, that can cause a big range of digestive issues. Now aesthetic, that was about a 5% risk at probably an upper limit. Uh, I have seen some studies say higher numbers, but not the most credible studies. What is much, much more common is atrophic gastritis, also called thyrogastric syndrome. So somewhere around 30 to 40% of people with autoimmune thyroid disease have atrophic gastritis. That makes the stomach less able to make stomach acid, and it makes it to where food cannot be digested as well. It also makes it harder to maintain a good, healthy bowel flora. So it can, it's about eight times more common than celiac is in those with thyroid disease. So that's a good thing to consider as well. A question I hear a lot, a follow-up question is, if the problem is low stomach acid, can you just take hydrochloric acid pills? Many experts encourage that. Well, if someone has atrophic gastritis, that's pretty much the worst thing they can do because they're not making stomach acid, but they're also not making mucin and they're not making bicarbonate. That means their stomach cannot protect themselves against acid. And whatever acid they make 
gives them a higher risk for esophageal and stomach cancers. So supplementing with acid would cause those exact same problems. Um, yeah, you have to eat gluten for 30 days for an accurate test. Yeah, Lynn's, you're right. And I've seen some papers about that talking about the actual quantities of gluten. It's substantial. If you've been gluten-free for some time, it takes pretty whopping amounts to have it show up properly. Vivian, best test to determine atrophic, atrophic gastritis. Yes, so there's markers that, that do show this. And one of the first things to show up would be anti-parietal cell antibodies and anti-gastrin antibodies, uh, and just gastrin in circulation. So the anti-parietal cell antibodies, or APA, that's generally the earliest indicator of the disease. And if that's present over time, that can start breaking down the stomach cells in ways to where the levels of gastrin in the bloodstream, they elevate. So APA is the first sign of the disease process starting. Elevated gastrin is the first sign of there being cellular damage taking place. Now, biopsies are also useful and scopes are useful for that. They won't show as sensitive at those earliest stages as those blood markers can. So that's how someone does really screen for that. If someone does have blood markers show up suspicious for it, then a scope is smart to see if there's more damage than expected and possible early signs of esophageal or stomach cancer. So yeah, that's how one would screen for that basically. Okay, so here's a great one, Patricia. What is the difference between your second opinion consultations and what? <laughs> well, the difference between those and I'll, I'll just assume you're talking about like a normal office visit. So yeah, I practiced for 25 years. I stopped in 2016. Uh, we've got three great doctors at Integrative Health that still do practice. And they work with people in Arizona, California, Washington, Oregon, Utah, Montana, Pretty solid about those. I'm very solid on the first several, but those are the six states that we work with people from. And that's just limits of telemedicine regulations. So those are all the states in which we practice. Now, by practicing, that means taking over all facets of care. That can be prescribing, you know, ordering ultrasounds, whatever else. So yeah, they work directly with everyone. I've trained them. We do case reviews. I oversee them. They're awesome. You can do fine with them. Now, for me, yes, I, I, I do second opinion consults. With these, I don't act as a prescriber. I don't order lab tests or ultrasounds, but I act kind of like a, like a grandparent. I'm like working behind the scenes to help just guide you. So I'll give you ideas that you can then carry out with your existing medical team. And I write up documentation that you can just give to them directly. Like here's what Dr. C would suggest. And I'm happy to make sense of that with your medical team. But yes, as the second opinions, it's me one-on-one -on -one with you. We're there for a good length of time. We go through all of your data and I talk about what are the findings, what are the diagnosis, what are the most important steps for you. And I will completely spell everything out. And I'll give you some good guidelines that then local doctor back home can help out with. Now, the cool thing about those is I'm not restricted about where you are. I've had a lot of folks from outside of the United States I've done consults with. It's totally fine. So for those, that's at thyroidopinion.com. I'll put that in the text here of the chat. Oops, I'm on all caps. I don't want to be yelling. Thyroid opinion. I'm putting this up there. Uh, I'm normally booked out for a bunch of months. And for quite a while, I didn't have openings until after August. So I wasn't even really talking about these. But there were a few openings. I had a few more time slots that I put in for this next month. So there are some times there and I am available. And again, normally it's booked out quite a ways, but there are a few openings. So that's available if anyone does, um, does want personal guidance. Um, yeah. Okay, a lot of good questions, you guys. Um, let me see if I can't find one or two more. I always hate leaving things unanswered. I like to be able to help out. Uh, thank you so much for addressing proper celiac testing. Such important for to get out there. Yeah, thank you for that. Obviously, you're an expert in this area, so I appreciate your feedback. Um, I'm looking on Instagram right now. Yeah, Anne, this is one that's a tough one. Uh, can you talk more about what to do if you have low stomach acid, how to know? Thank you. So low stomach acid, the atrophic gastritis is what I was talking about. That's one of the more common causes of low stomach acid. And... To know if you have it, that was the testing I talked about before about the APA and gastrin blood markers 
and or data from upper GI uh, endoscopies. What to do about it? Mostly it's a matter of tracking relevant nutrients and keeping those caught up. So nutrients get malabsorbed and uh, iron, B12, zinc, that's generally the main ones. And also that's generally the order that it goes in. So the earliest signs of damage, iron's the first thing to drop off, then B12, then zinc, then many others. Those who do have that, some do require non-oral versions of those nutrients. I'm really excited. There is a new version of iron called Easy Iron. And this was really made to help with people that have atrophic gastritis. That was my main motivation for that. I'm going to get a link for you guys for that. But there's a lot of data about ways in which iron could be better absorbed that hadn't been really used in iron formulations before. And I've seen so many people that have a hard time keeping their iron built up. They take iron and it just doesn't work. Or they know that if they take enough to work, it's going to like tear up their stomach. They're going to feel awful from that. So there's been all this data about how organic acids, uh, piperine can make a big difference, about how they can synergize with ferrous fumarate. And that didn't exist. No one had done that before. So this is a brand new version. It's called Easy Iron. And that's available at shop.thyroidspecificformulations.com if you're on Instagram. But that's a version of iron that's much better absorbed with those that have atrophic gastritis, which is very difficult absorption in general. Um, one more. Oh, aesthetic. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. You think she's talking about 99 personalized thyroid plan. Got it. Okay, aesthetic. You, you could well be right. There is the personal thyroid plan. That's a whole lot of uh, recordings. It's guidance. And it's pretty cool because it's pre-made training, but it asks you questions and it directs you to which parts of the training are most useful for you. So that, that's a great thing too. That's really toward the goal of reducing your dependency upon third medications, perhaps needing none, at least needing less, but that's what that one is. So the, the second opinion is just me talking through, giving you guidance in person. Um, oh, yep, it was there, Patricia. My apologies for not seeing that. And last one, easy one, um, Anne, can one be allergic to iodine? I've been told I was, but it doesn't seem to make sense for me to start to survive. And you're right. So now the sources of iodine are really common allergens. And in a lot of cases, they're allergens because they have iodine. This is, I'm going to tease this apart. So I'm going to make sense of this. So they're not allergens because iodine's in them, but they're allergens because iodine generates so many free radicals around other things your body can attack those other things. That's why thyroid disease starts. When there's extra iodine in the thyroid, it makes free radicals and your immune system then attacks the structures of the thyroid. It's really that simple. There's more of a story with thyroglobulin, pyrazole residues, you know, cellular apoptosis, but that's really all it is. The extra free radicals damage the tissues, your body comes in attacking all that and starts to go after the thyroid by mistake. Now, there's a similar story with iodine in foods and with iodine in medications. So those things tend to also generate a lot of free radicals and tend to heighten an immune response. So shellfish and seafood, that's why they can become allergenic. That's why a lot of sea vegetable extracts can become allergenic. And then iodine contrast can be very allergenic, fatally so for people. But ultimately, it's not the iodine because you're right. You couldn't live if you were attacking that actual element. It's all the stuff that comes with it. But... We attack the stuff that comes with it because iodine is such a volatile thing. <laughs> so hope that made some sense. All right. Whew. I got worked up today. So we talked about RS Complete. Had some food props. My butter's getting soft and squishy. <laughs> but yeah, good questions, you guys. Nice to see you all this evening. Back with you next Monday. I'll keep an eye out for things on social media between now and then and take great care of yourself. Go eat some food that has some RS in it. I'm about to go make some, um, I'm doing some brown rice and a healthy version of a mushu pork tonight. So this is cool. The RS source of this, this is a really neat, rather obscure source of RS, but rice paper. So, so mushu, you go to a Chinese restaurant, you get mushu, they make these little pancakes, right? Uh, I just read a cookbook talking about how you make those. I'm not going to make those. <laughs> They're not good foods. <laughs> uh, once a blue moon, I had those in restaurants, but I've never made them at home. Probably the last time was like maybe 20 years ago. 
So yeah, I was thinking about turning a healthy version of that, but I'm ditching the whole pancakes, but rice paper, I've made uh, the uh, like the spring rolls that you get, the, the fresh spring rolls that a lot of Vietnamese restaurants have, they use rice paper. It's just pure rice starch. All you do is wet it, put what you want in there and roll it up. That's actually a really rich source of high amylopectin. It's a high source of resistant starch. And the rice papers, you get this nice big package of them. They're about this big. You get probably a hundred of them in a pack or so, and they're really easy to work with. You just take them and float them in a dish of water for about a minute or two, and they start to get all soft. And they're really nice and durable. You put things in there and roll those up. So I'm going to go make some mushu. The actual mushu itself, I've got a, a great recipe that I modified. It'll be totally healthy and good. Then I'm going to roll those up with rice paper. So that'll be the RS for tonight's meal. All right. Have a good evening. I'll see you guys really soon. Bye-bye.